Hello there, everybody, and welcome back to episode 4 of Space's Hard Vacuum with Cerberus. And here, as you can see, I've already built you a... was going to say a pretty little satellite. And maybe it is, but really it's the Vanguard probe. This little guy right here, who, because he's so small, you kind of have to stick stuff awkwardly to it. Whatever. It's a satellite. It's going to do the job. It's got a reaction wheel because I like to have them. We've already been over this. I will put one in whenever I can. And we have some solar panels to keep it going because it's going to be in space for a while. It's not going to be like a little 20 minute flight like some of the earlier ones. The Explorer probe has to do science in low orbit, but also in high orbit. As we discussed before as well, high orbit for Earth in this mod pack is counted to be anything above the altitude of geostationary orbit, 35,786 kilometers. That's kind of high up. And we don't have to make a whole circular orbit over there. We just have to kind of get up there and stay there long enough to make a transmission back home with the science data. I mean, ultimately, we could probably even just keep the data and fall back later and transmit it. But we're gonna, we're gonna need we're gonna need radio signal in order to send the command anyway. So we'll beam the data home once we get up there. But first, we're gonna need to get this rocket. We're gonna need a rocket, I should say, to get this satellite up there, because 1509 meters per second of delta v is not quite gonna be enough. So, let's get right started building a rocket to carry this thing with probably a uh, rough estimate is that I'm going to want to give it about 12,000 more meters per second of delta V just to have a bit of a margin of safety. So, we've got our fairing base. That's an important thing to have. See how much we can shrink this. We'll try that. Test it out with a conic fairing. Um, like that. That works pretty well. Bring it down one more and see what that does. I'd say that's still fine too. We'll go with that. So that whole stage, including payload fairing and base masses little less than a quarter of a ton. So we won't need too much crazy rocket in order to get this all the way up there. I'm sure that's attached reasonably properly. Yeah, it looks to be. Shrink it down. It's gonna be a one meter. And now we just have to find a suitable one meter rocket engine, which I think we've just found already. That was good. That was quick. First try. Upper stage. It's the right size. Probably a decent thrust class at 50 kilonewtons. Uh, maybe a little more. We can upgrade it from tech level one. It can be ignited once. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's have a look. I like to have two ignitions on my upper stages. It's just better, in my opinion. It's safer that way, I guess. This one can ignite infinite times, but it's got 130. That's a bit too much thrust, I think. Yes, there is such a thing. Although it's not such a big deal for an upper stage, because we won't have to worry too much about aerodynamic forces by the time we light up the upper stage rocket. Now we can use these, at least some of these. 66, not that one. 129, not that one. Infinite times on that as well. Oh no, never mind. That's bigger than I remember it being. <laughs> I guess we're not using that one. Uh, 340 is too much. I know there's, yeah, this one here, 70, one time. One time. Well, actually, first, 
sometimes we get more ignitions if we change fuel types. One, one. Okay, sometimes we get more ignitions if we up the tech level, but no. Okay. We'll take another quick looky here. I, w I would like to get one with two. That's too small. If we have to do it on one, we have to do it on one. We'll do it on one. Screw it. What have we got here? 55 thrust. That's definitely the better for specific impulse. We'll keep it on Caro locks. Actually, wait. I set myself an arbitrary, an arbitrary requirement that I wouldn't start using kerosene liquid oxygen until tech level three, I think. So, whatever. We'll roll with it. I'm not sure how historically accurate that is. I know they didn't start using kerosene and liquid oxygen right away, but I know they were using liquid oxygen pretty early on. And I mean, kerosene is not that hard for them to have come by. Just take some jet fuel and refine it a little further, and it's basically what you need in a loose sense. 308, 298. Well, we'll go for this, the UDMH and N204. That one right there. That's actually not a bad amount of delta V from a quite a short upper stage, and we can we've got thrust to spare on this. Definitely lots of thrust to spare. We'll put it there. We'll make it. Nah, we'll go for an even length rather than an even thrust to weight ratio. I was going for an exact light up thrust to weight ratio of two, which you can see up in the top left on my delta V stats. That's what I'm looking at. We'll go for a three meter tank instead. That's, wow, that's not bad. The upper stage is doing, going to do quite a lot there. Maxing out at thrust rate ratio of 14.8. <laughs> oh, I love it. Speaking of which, make sure I got, not this. This tank is full. This is... We'll go to MMH and N204 on this one, actually. And there we go. Similar. I might have even lost a bit of Delta V there, I think. I wasn't paying too much attention. So that has got 7,414. We could launch this, literally. It's got enough thrust on at sea level. And we could almost get this into orbit, and it's just the upper stage. So we'll bring this up to three and a half meters. Like that. Of course, the, the problem there is that the bigger you make the upper stage, the bigger you're going to have to make the lower stage in order to allow it to lift your upper stage into orbit. Stage fairing adapter. Just quickly remember how to use it. Just like that. Get some test fairings here. See how that's shaped? That's not bad. Bring that shape in a smidge more. I think I basically just undid all the change there when I came, pulled that back. There we go. We'll go with that. Now let's see, do I want a one meter lower stage? Now, how about it? We got lots of bigger engines than that. Like this one. That's a two meter. So we'll 
We'll check that one out. 570 kilonewtons of thrust. That's that's plenty for the size of stage we're probably going to be building here. So we'll give that a go. We'll slap a tank on it. We will do just a regular cylindrical tank. Actually, speaking of which, what do I have in... I've got definitely non-cryogenic hypergolic fuels in this cryogenic tank. Hmm. Okay, well, you know, it won't take too much to fix that quickly. And we'll grab ourselves a cylindrical balloon tank, just like that. Bring it down to one meter. Three and a half in length, just there we go. Actually, we'll stick the engine back on there so that it knows in the action groups what fuel we want. We want that one, the UDMH N204, for our A9R right there. So that's good to go again. Start. Oh, I accidentally switched the texture. We'll worry about that later. Go for a two meter tank. Two. At least I think that engine's a two. Bring this up to a just under two meter kind of diameter. Bring that. Okay. Maybe we can reattach that. Apparently, kind of, not really. Sort of. We'll go with that. Recheck the fairings, all four of them. No, the fairings, not the whole lower stage, please. Okay. So we need to make this base a little bit bigger. Just a smidge, because the fairings are not that thick. There we go. That'll do. <gasps> and we'll leave that for now. Stick this underneath, make sure it fits. And it does. Pretty much perfectly. Two meters. Check out the... Well, this one only uses kerosene and liquid oxygen. All right, then. Kerosene and liquid oxygen it is. Tech level two. Lots and lots of thrust on that now. It went up from 570 to 654. Good stuff. I like having lots of thrust. Means we can build a great big lower stage if we have to. That bigger. Obviously going to make it considerably bigger. Go for seven and a half meters. Still got lots of thrust. Lots and lots and lots of thrust. Okay. That means we have too much thrust. And like I said, you can have too much thrust. We do not want a launch thrust weight ratio above two. That's just going to cause us all sorts of problems trying to get this thing to actually ascend out of the atmosphere in an orderly fashion. I sure as hell don't want that one. And the B7's a one meter. Okay. 230. Looks about the right size. It is a launch engine. And it has a thrust level which is such that we are going to need some boosters. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. Let's actually bring this down again to 3 meters. 3 meters. And 
And this one is 7.5. It's actually kind of a bit of a short stubby rocket. But mind you, I'm used to building like these 20 meter tall, 1 meter system rockets. We'll bring that one up to 8. <clears throat> okay. From there, we're going to have to, looking at that thrust to weight ratio at launch, we're going to need some boosters. Our delta V is looking pretty good though. Our boosters will. Well, we probably don't need four of them. We definitely don't need seven. Let's go for two. I'm I'm liking two. Two sounds good. And we'll stick them about there. We will use some of these wonderful procedural. Where are they? So I find them. Once I cure my blindness. I do have them, don't I? Maybe I don't have them yet. I thought I had them. <laughs> Am I just not seeing them? Hmm. Okay. Well, that's going two because that's the kick motor yeah that's not it all right we're going to take a trip to the science center after this we're going to make it work anyway i've got some standard boosters here we can use i'll use a few of these i might have to go for more than two Put them into the same stage together. Yeah, we're probably going to need more than two of these. Where the hell? <laughs> I do... Huh. Okay, well... At this point, I'm just afraid that, you know, someone is going to see these and I haven't and... Just, yeah... Go for four. Four of these guys. Stick them down here. God, that's odd. Bring the tech level up to two. Burn for a while. 1.08 thrust weight ratio. <laughs> that's not good. Did I upgrade this engine? No, I didn't. And, yeah, okay, we get a little more thrust out of that. 1.18. It's, it's a little lower than I'm used to launching at. But hey, whatever. Nothing like experimenting a little bit. Okay. Gonna need to bring down, probably, especially once I hook these back up. Okay, those and those actually bring the aerodynamic center down quite a bit. That's downright acceptable. Ah, uh, what do I want? What do I want? I want launch towers. No, I want umbilical towers. Unless I don't have those either? That's mighty strange. I don't need two. This is like the one with the, yeah, with the... Like the walkway on it for astronauts to get on. I just wanted the little one with the, with like the fuel pump connectors in it. This bears further investigation later. But for now, we'll just go with it. And I'll wonder whether I A, have missing parts, or B, 
have just gone crazy and think I have unlocked parts that I haven't unlocked yet. Two of those there. Just for kicks, I suppose. And we will pick ourselves a texture or two. What do we want? Green? Green tank. Can't change those, can we? Those are going to be white. We definitely don't want the foil tank. There's the, the Chinese booster look. And there's a few more looks, which don't make a lot of sense. And some way too stretched out ones. And that's a solid booster. That's a plain white tank. I think we're going to come full circle here pretty soon. Yep, pretty much. All right, then. Well, hell with it. We'll go with that one. This one can have... What can it have? Sure, why not? Let's run with that. And one day, I will even have that beautiful suspension boom stand for my desk so I won't keep bumping into my microphone. <laughs> 13,434 meters per second. That's not bad. I'm not sure it's going to work because we're going to be spending a fair bit of time in the... Well, maybe not. It's actually not a bad launch thrust to ratio. It's just shy of 1.2. I kind of like more like 1.3, and yes, that makes more of a difference than you may think. We have the delta V. It comes down to how good it's going to be at using it. So here we go. The oh, I don't remember what horse stands for anymore. I thought about it a couple days ago, and now it's now I've forgotten. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to check staging here while I try to think about that. We also need to reattach these because it's got the staging all wrong on them. There we go. As long as all four of them are showing up, three there, one there, we're good. It was only showing me the one, and I was pretty sure it was only going to light up the one, and that would have been a little bit catastrophic. Because, well, it either wouldn't have gotten off the ground and would have tipped over, or it would have gotten off the ground and immediately tipped over. So that will light up. Then those and the launch clamps go... We do not want our payload fairings coming off there. We want them coming off there. Those are our clamps for the solid boosters. Then we got those. And a little later... Um, oh, we want those to come off up there. All right, now I think we've, we're getting somewhere. So let's see if we get somewhere. Okay, so here we go with the perhaps slightly stubby launcher vehicle for the Horse Mark I satellite. Throttle it up and engage SAS. Ignite the main engine. And then we are go. gracefully lifting away from the launch pad. Making lots of noise with those solid booster rockets on it. We'll 
go for starting to tip over, gimbal over, at about... Let's go for 80 meters per second. That's it, SAS is turned off, I am hands off, we're going to let gravity do its thing. Getting the uh, getting the direction, the compass direction of the uh, of the flight path to actually be somewhere near 90 degrees. When I do these natural gravity turns, sometimes it'll kind of wobble north south a little bit, and it'll end up facing 70 degrees. I've had one that happened at like 120 degrees. I was, you know, a solid 30 degrees off where I wanted to be. This one, however, is. Uh, Doing pretty good. I mean, we're at 90 now. It's kind of around 89, 88 at times, but that'll work just fine. Ditch those solid boosters. Thrust to weight is... That's a bit low for where you want to be at this point, but just means we'll have a bit of a shallower ascent profile as gravity works on us a little bit faster than maybe normal. That's okay, we still have lots of thrust to make this launch happen. And it's only going to get better from here anyway. We're going to work our way up to about a 5.3 thrust to weight ratio, which will be lots by the time this engine burns out. going to happen in a little under two minutes, but for us, it's probably going to take a little more than that. Got some interesting things happening now aerodynamically. I'm going to have to try to correct manually. Try to get this back somewhere near... Get a little help from SAS there. Switch to orbital velocity. Gonna have to do a little bit of manual adjustment here, apparently. I've got to figure out which which way is up with the rocket tilted in this direction, which is kind of tough to do. From there, side slip angle is not bad, so we'll release SAS again and see what it does. This, as you can see, is I think this might be the first rocket I've launched that didn't have any kind of, you know, stabilization fins on it at the bottom, just to kind of keep that aerodynamic center, that center of lift, locked down near the bottom. And so now we're dealing with a bit more change in that. Uh, relative to the center of mass, so it started to do some, st not some strange things, but some things I'm not used to. Just gonna help its trajectory again a little bit here. Honestly, we don't mind a trajectory that's gonna climb out a little more steeply, because we do have to get really, really high with this rocket. about 25 seconds left on the lower stage. Release SAS again here. We 
we have enough thrust now or thrust to weight ratio now that the the pitch isn't going to fall too much we're accelerating quite quickly okay, at this point when I decouple right here now light up the upper stage we'll just have this guy face prograde Just like that, and that will just, we've got it on autopilot now, that'll just keep it pointing in whatever the orbital prograde direction is, so it'll very slowly kind of shallow out a little bit, but that's okay, we've got lots of time. Our apoapsis is climbing, so this should still work. It is, however, going to take, um, well, I mean, we're not going to have anything like the orbit that we need um, for at least another couple of minutes. I admit I'm actually not entirely sure what the orbit shape is going to be like when this stage burns out because, of course, again, I did some testing, but it wasn't exactly this vehicle in sandbox mode. That's right, sandbox. I won't have to make a little subtitle on the video once I edit it to call myself an idiot for calling it career mode this time. But on that vehicle in sandbox mode, it was more of like a, it was a little... 0.5 meter spindly little thing and it had something like 6,500 meters per second of delta V but it took about six minutes to burn its fuel rather than just over two. So I'm not quite sure what we're going to see here. Hopefully it'll be something good. going to jettison these manually though. A little bit less mass because we don't need the mass. We're out of the atmosphere and we can extend this antenna as well. So now we've got a an on paper range of 10,000 kilometers on this antenna. I'm also going to start the data recorder on the Explorer Pro because we're going to need 12,000 of it, and it's going to take a while, looking at the rate that it's gathering it at, to get 12,000, we just hit, well, we're about to hit 12, so it'll have to go through that another thousand times. <coughs> Apoapsis is climbing nice and quickly now, and the periapsis is rushing upward through the, through the depths of the earth here now too, which is good higher that gets, the less likely we'll crash back into the Earth. We don't like crashing back into the Earth. Not with our expensive satellite science probes named after horses. We don't want that. So again, we're looking for an apoapsis not too far above, but just above 35,786 kilometers. 35.786 megameters if you're looking at the orbit info uh, on the center right of the screen just getting up past seven, eight, nine, so we're we're gonna get pretty close just on this slower stage if we don't actually hit it. It's really shooting up there now. Thirty five thousand three hundred and eighty kilometers. That's not bad. And that <laughs> decoupling with that little tiny teeny decoupler actually just raised our apoapsis by What was that? 220 kilometers, I think. <laughs> so we're almost there. And the nice thing is, it's actually worked out pretty well, because that upper stage, which is now debris, is not going to become space junk in orbit, because at the point where we let it go, our periapsis is actually, like, if we stay on this orbit, we will crash. That means that tank will crash. So I've actually done this better than I thought I would. I'm being environmentally conscious in terms of the orbit anyway. We won't talk about the fact that a little bit of trace rocket fuel and all of those heavy metals and stuff and are going to burn up and spread out to the atmosphere. We don't worry about that. We're worried about space junk, space litter. That's what we're trying to avoid. Take a look at ourselves here. You can see we're going to go all the way out there, 
Actually, we're going to go a little farther than that because we have a few hundred more kilometers to go. And we're going to do that sooner rather than later. We're actually going to use the maneuver planner to do it. We can get rid of the flight data as well to clear up a little more of the screen. We will get rid of this empty stage so that the engine ignites or gets primed or whatever. It's ready to go. We want to change our apoapsis to actually just above that number. Uh, we want to give ourselves a little bit of time above that orbit to actually collect some data and do some experiments. So we will go for 36,500. Actually, you know what? We can save ourselves a little bit of... Uh, actually, no. Hmm. We, we may or may not be saving ourselves some, some fuel, but regardless, just in case we get out of range, we will set our periapsis at the same time. We'll create the node, just have a look at it. That's... Hmm. That's quite a steep um, directional change. That's very steep. Let's see what happens if we do them one at a time. Oh, wow. Okay. We'll do this a bit differently. We'll take care of the apoapsis now. Perfect. And we will take care of the periapsis a little later. And I will actually, I'll, I'll explain that here because I left something a little bit unexplained. This antenna has an omnidirectional range of 10 megameters, 10,000 kilometers. Some of you have probably already realized by now that 36.53 megameters is approximately 3.65 times more than 10 megameters. But thanks to the modeling in the in the configuration for remote tech that I'm using, this is actually something where if you go back into my earlier videos, our our wonderful and oft-mentioned friend Nathan Kell actually did a bit of explaining. He um, gave us, well, me primarily, anybody wants to read his comment on my first episode, a little bit of a lesson in a little bit of math and some, I guess, radio antenna science... Basically, this thing is going to have a range higher than 10,000 kilometers because there are antennas, antennae, ground stations on the Earth, which I have set to have a range of 75,000 kilometers. I think I may, I, I went over this a little bit as well in, in previous episodes, but after episode one. And basically, I did a little bit of rough math on this myself, and this antenna, with its on-paper range of 10,000 kilometers, will have sufficient gain when you do the math modeled in, counting the 75,000 kilometer range of the ground stations, we will actually be able to talk to the Earth at the limit is approximately the height we're going to get up to. So we may get up there and find that... Uh, we may get up there and find that we're at a range. That's why I want to have an orbit established already, such that if we are at a range, we, want, we aren't going to need to fix our orbit in a place where we can't do it. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get out past 10,000 here, and I will show you this, just to prove it. 9,000, 10,000. Now, at this point, there could be a ground station directly beneath us on the surface of the Earth, which I think would actually be in the Atlantic Ocean right now, just off the coast of Africa. But if there were an antenna there right now with a range of 10,000 kilometers, and this was just working strictly on the, the range, we'd be out of range. But as you can see, we're not. In fact, we're talking to ground stations all over the place that aren't directly beneath us. One in Algeria. I'm thinking we're getting Israel. We're getting some in southern Russia. And I think we're getting the one over in Iran. And the one in South America. All the way across the Atlantic. 
And while I'm here, we will check our delta V. See, look at that. Now it's going to take, it's gone, it's come down from, I think it was like 1100 meters per second. It's now, now we can do 100 meters per second if we wanted to fix our periapsis. Now I'm going to wait a little longer because I know that we can get out to at least 20 or 25 or 30,000 kilometers uh, altitude without any risk. Once we get out near 34, 35,000, it's going to start to depend on whether there is a ground station kind of right beneath us. Go around, yeah, just outside 25,000. We'll see how that is. 47.6 meters per second now. I'm totally satisfied with that. We've got lots to spare, so we'll just do it now in the interest of being very, very safe. We even got a little more apoapsis out of that as well. 36,820 kilometers. Which might actually be a little bit too risky. However, well, we're still collecting data anyway. I, I knew going into this, it's going to take us two orbits. It's just going to take us two orbits. There is not enough time for the data recorder to record 24,000 units of data in the space of half an orbit. It might be able to do it in one orbit, but then we're going to need the second orbit just to get up high again. So we will leave this as it is. This will stay in space forever now. We'll set orientation to something a little more uh, sunlight friendly to make sure our batteries stay charged because yeah, we were draining the battery there a little bit by having it facing just the wrong way. We'll get a little higher again. Oh, we're still draining the battery a little. Well, we're definitely going to drain the battery now because we're going behind the Earth. Data recorder is full. We're at 33,000 kilometers. We're still in low orbit. So now we will do the low orbit experiment right there. 100 science. Send it home. Make it happen. 1.7 science added. <laughs> I'm hoping I just missed the message where I got the other 98.3. I'm hoping. Start the data recorder up again. Oh, we've got the sun back again at least. That's nice. And we will... What will we do? Maybe force a roll of zero degrees... seem to still be consuming a little bit too much electricity. Channel of 30. Get some light onto three panels. There we go. We have up way up at the top right, we have a negative consumption. That's all we're looking for. That means we're not going to run out anytime soon. The data recorder, I do have it running. And as you can see, we'd have to get a hell of a lot higher than 36,000 kilometers to just have enough time in high orbit to do this all at once. And then at that point, I definitely wouldn't have the antenna range. So let this play out a little bit. Let it record some data. Briefly get up into in space high, and then we've got no connection. Why do we have no connection? Because... There aren't any red dots right beneath us. So the, the extra distance of having to kind of reach maybe, all, well, we'll call it halfway across the radius of the Earth, plus the extra for the angle. We don't even need to do the trigonometry. Just the fact that these are not at the very point of the Earth underneath us. They're a little bit farther than the edge of the Earth, than the, than the surface underneath us. So there's little extra range that I deal with that we don't have, but that's okay because we'll start falling again here and we'll get it back. So we'll have control of the satellite again, just right there. Data recorder is full. Perfect. So now we just have to wait, come around again, just like that. Whip around, time warp a little more, come back out to 
an altitude high enough, 32, 33, 34, 35, and we'll bring down the time warp, 400, 500, we'll be there any minute now, uh, 11 kilometers short, warp up a little bit, Now, I didn't see a little transition there, but we are in space high, over Kerbin, or in our case, Earth. Discovery of the outer Van Allen belt. Hey, go us. We've discovered ourselves another Van Allen belt. I wish my name was Van Allen. We're just naming it after some other guy, I guess. Hey, I discovered this belt, and I'm going to name it after you, Mr. Van Allen. He's going to be real happy. It's going to be the best birthday present ever. There's 87. I'm looking at this this time. Another 56. Okay. Another 32. 87 and 60. That's 100. That's not all of it, is it? That's not 250. Unless I still didn't see all the messages. Damn. Okay. Well, we'll keep that data recorder going. We'll do another orbit if we have to. We got time. We got solar panels. We can do this. And then I proceed to spend much of the next, well, all of the next several minutes dicking with the rotation angle of this probe and trying to get it so the solar panels are facing just the right way so that we have a power balance. And, you know, I, I literally, I mean, this is four times speed that you're seeing. So we've already covered a solid minute or more, and I'm still just messing with this and now finally I'm gonna go and try to make another orbit or two and I'm gonna stop and sightsee a few times or I'm gonna do whatever I'm doing and basically it's because of the fact that we're running into the same problem here that I was running into with the earlier experiments and earlier videos gotta do experiment experiments more than once to try to get all the science and so there's just a bunch more orbits here and finally I get done with all of that and We'll go back to uh, old live me right about now. So we will call that a successful launch of the horse Mark I, and it's going to stay here. And if we need to keep coming back and pulling the last little shavings of science out of the radiation belts, by God, we're going to do it. Back to the space center. 554 science to work with. Now, see, I didn't check to see how much I had beforehand. I don't really remember. So 554 science. We've got the Explorer probe up, the Vanguard probe up there. We had already done the Explorer probe in the last episode. That's the WAC bumper. We haven't done these yet, so we still don't have to unlock this empty node or Luna 1 and 2, because we've still got these two, which were added in the latest version that I I guess I didn't skip, they just weren't there when I worked my way through. Might be worth getting some early comm dishes though. I'm not sure what kind of communications I have. We're going to need to start going farther out than... Well, not quite this far out yet. There was nothing in that one. Maybe I'll get some early comm dishes because these are a little more reasonable. They probably mass a little less, even if they don't mass a little less. They have, the dishes have wider cone angles because of their shorter range, like 400 megameters, 400,000 kilometers is plenty for moon stuff. So we're going to get this one, 100 science, just like that. And there's nothing more in these anyway. I think we basically have pretty much all the communications equipment just from these two nodes, early comm dishes and early comms. Um, hey, whatever. It could be worth just grabbing this to have some extra solar panels at my disposal. So we'll grab that for 100. How much of these next ones are going to cost? 200 is not bad. What did I grab? Oh yeah, that was these, which I don't need. Nothing in them. 50 there for landing legs. Don't need that. 250 for that. Don't need that. We've we've seen we've still got plenty of rocket that we can use. Where the hell? Oh, 
That's odd. Fuel tanks. I wonder where my SRBs went. I don't th think they're in there. Hmm. I'll have to investigate that more at another time. I'm okay not having that stuff yet either at this point. I'm okay with that. All right, so a couple of unlocks there. We'll use some of that nifty stuff in the next launches, maybe. And that'll just about do it, I think, because, well, I got to keep the videos down to a reasonable length. And we're already getting to the point where it's a little of an unreasonable length. I will show this, though. There's the nice blue sky of Earth rather than the kind of white horizon sky. Worked a little bit of my own tweaks on better atmospheres fixes to just kind of make that uh, atmosphere glow for Kerbin just a little more reasonable. You know, it's uh, it might even be a little bit too dark up high, but at least it's not bright white on the horizon because that just wasn't didn't make any sense. That's it for episode four. Uh, episode five, I suppose, will launch those new probes and see what they do. See how much science I get from them. And uh, I look forward to... Well, I'm not going to see you guys. I look forward to you guys seeing me do that. Then, I suppose. And any, at any rate, I will catch you all next time.